it is the parents' duty to take care of their child. Well, that socially applies to human because, well, we are humans. As a species, human exhibit parental care. Not only is it a social construct, we also evolved to be like this. That's our survival strategy. However, that's not the case for all animals. Some animals just lay their eggs and leave, not even saying they're buying milk. But that's normal for those animals. They simply have a different survival strategy, especially the R strategies, animals that have a lot of offsprings. However, some non-human animals do exhibit parental care, of course, with varying degree too. Some even exhibit alloparenting, which you could argue to be an advanced level of parental care, whether it's intentional or not. So, let me bring up the question. What exactly is alloparenting? Let's just answer the question straight away. Alloparenting is parental care provided by an individual towards individuals that are not their offsprings. To put it very simply, when an individual take care of another individual's child, when they become babysitter, basically. Of course, this is also prevalent in human, but if you're talking about non-human animals, this is actually a rare feat. Why? Well, because looking after a kid is not easy. It takes a lot of resources, especially energy, and of course, time. Your time. The time that you could use to, well, do whatever you want for yourself, basically. Okay, but with those disadvantages, why would alloparenting happen? Well, the reasons would differ between species. The most basic advantage of alloparenting is the formation of a group, a community. Think of it like this. If you live alone in the wilderness and a predator attacks you, your chance of survival depends on yourself. However, if you are currently cooperating with another individual of your species to take care of their offsprings, and then a predator attack, now you are a group trying to defend against a predator. That would increase your survival chance. Okay, but what if the parents just run away and leave you behind? Well, that is less likely to happen because that would mean they are also leaving behind their offsprings. And then of course, you are building reputation for yourself, building relation. I mean, you did help them take care of their offsprings. Surely they'll do the same. Right? Right? Well, there's no guarantee of course, but it'll be more likely to happen. Besides that, taking care of another parent's children would mean you could live with them. You are sharing a territory, maybe even a nest, and so you don't need to find a place for yourself. And also, you gain experience on taking care of a children. So in the future, when you have some offsprings of yourself, you are better at taking care of them better at making sure they survive. So yeah, it's not exactly altruism. It is indeed beneficial, albeit not immediately rewarding in many cases. And so, after multiple generations of doing this, it just becomes a thing for your species. It becomes the natural things to do. And that's how your species exhibit alloparenting. As with parental cares, there are multiple ways for an individual to take care of another individual's offsprings. The simplest way is by preparing a suitable nest or simply providing a safe territory for the offsprings to reside. That way, they don't exactly need to take care of another parent's offspring. They just passively do so. The next way is by providing nourishment for the offsprings. This could be done by sharing your food, deliberately seeking and bringing back food for the offsprings you are taking care of, or suckling, scientifically called allonursing. I'm pretty sure this is not a shocking truth because, well, humans do so too. But yes, some mammals do provide milk for another parent's offspring. This could naturally occur in cats and dogs. That's an easy example that you could easily observe in your daily life especially when a mother cat or dog lost their kitten and puppies, or when you have multiple mother cats in your house or something like that. They might have excess milk, so allo nursing is not even costly for them. If you don't want a common example, then I present to you sea lions. They also exhibit allo nursing. Moving on, another form of allo parenting, which might arguably be the most advanced form, 
is directly tending the offsprings. This includes looking after them, quite literally I mean, playing with them, and even teaching them. So yeah, this one requires the most dedication from the alloparents, which is why only few mammals and birds exhibit this kind of alloparenting. Aside from the multiple ways alloparenting are provided, there are multiple types of alloparenting based on the interactions or relationships between the alloparents and the offsprings being taken care of. So let's talk about each of those types. But before that... The first one, and the most positive one, is cooperative breeding. In cooperative breeding, Alloparents assist in the reproduction success of other individuals while they themselves are not in the reproduction phase, or at least not yet. In many cases, the alloparents are one's own kin. A good example would be some species of jackals, like the golden jackals and sidestripe jackals. In their case, one-year-old usually stays in their mother's territory to help tend the new offsprings of their mother. Oh, just to clarify, for these animals, one year old is already a sexually mature individual. So yeah, where other species usually live after reaching sexual maturity, they stay to help their mother instead. In other cases, like in Ethiopian wolf, meerkats, and some New World monkeys like marmosets and tamarins, reproduction is the privilege of the dominant males and females. In their case, Non-dominant females, or also called subordinates, are reproductively repressed. They themselves don't reproduce. Instead, they take care of the alpha female's offsprings. In some species, their hormones will be activated as if they are in the reproductive phase. Why? Well, so that they can lactate, of course. That way, when alpha females, aka the actual mother of the offsprings are away, the subordinates could also do the suckling for the alpha. We've been talking about mammals, but what about other animal groups? Well, another obvious example would be birds. Actually, in some species of birds, cooperative breeding is obligatory. This is prevalent for some Australian and Sub-Saharan birds, where the survival rates of offsprings are abysmal. Basically, the only way for offsprings to survive is if they are defended all the time. But that would mean parents couldn't forage for food, which is why other individuals have to become alloparents, at the very least to watch over offsprings when their parents are away. If not, the next generation won't exist for them. Because, you know, all offsprings are dead. Hence why alloparenting becomes natural for them. Usually, but not always, the alloparents are their own kin. Another example which a lot of people might not think about as an animal that would exhibit cooperative breeding is insect. It is not common for insect to do so, of course. Some species of the Ambrosia beetle have been observed to exhibit cooperative breeding, where older offsprings delay maturity and stays with their mother to take care of their younger brothers and sisters. Another extreme case of cooperative breeding is the one that you can observe in the case of hymenopterans that form colonies. You know, things like bees, wasps, and ants. You could argue that, even in a regular colony, cooperative breeding always occurs, because only the queen does the whole reproduction for the colony. Other individuals, workers to be precise, helps the reproduction by foraging and taking care of the offsprings. And if you think about it, that is cooperative breeding. Another form of cooperative breeding, which some zoologists classify as its own thing, is joint brooding. Okay, that might be a bad choice of word. Let's rephrase that to join brood care instead. In this case, multiple reproductive parents join together to take care of their offsprings as a community. This is almost always a win win solution. Hence, in most cases, Non-kins are observed to exhibit this behavior. This type of alloparenting can be found in many primates, like in macaques, for example. Even reindeers are observed to reciprocally allo-nurse their offsprings. Sperm whales are also famous for their nursery group, where a group of females and their offspring sticks together and help each other. Surprisingly to some, some insects also exhibit this behavior. Well, to be precise, the one example that I could think of 
is the case of colony co-founding by some Hymenopterans. So, usually, one colony have its own queen, right? The queen is the center of a Hymenopteran colony. However, in some cases, two or more queens can join together to co-found a nest together. They share a nesting chamber together. Hence, they form a super colony, capable of producing more workers, growing population faster, and most likely outcompetes other colonies in the area. This behavior is scientifically called pleometrosis. We've been talking about the positive forms of alloparenting, so let's move on to the gray area, brood amalgamation. In this case, one individual left their brood and dumped the responsibility to another individual, hence forming an amalgamation of two or more different brood. There are two types of brood amalgamation. The first is where animals lay their egg in another animal's nest, hence the eggs are mixed with the original nest owner's egg. The second is where animals simply left their brood to be taken by another individual, either deliberately or by accident. Brood amalgamation is especially prevalent in waterfowls. You know, ducks, goslings, geese, and stuff like that. If you see a mother duck followed by dozens or even more ducklings, that's most likely another duck's offsprings. Either the mother left their offsprings behind, the mother is dead, or little ducklings just got lost and follow another mother instead. In this form of brood amalgamation, there is basically no benefit for the alloparent. However, that's not the case for the Bagrus meridionalis. This catfish is a big predator in the lake it inhabits. Other cichlid fishes usually leave their eggs in this catfish's nest. By doing so, a brood amalgamation is formed between the catfish's original brood and the brood of those that leave their eggs. In this case, when forming a school, Bagrus meridionalis will position the other offsprings in the outer layer. Hence, when the school is attacked, these other offsprings will be more vulnerable. And so, Bagrus meridionalis still got the benefit, even if other species are technically taking advantage of them. Like I said, that was the gray area of alloparenting. Now, Let's move on to the, um, red area, I guess, where the alloparents are obviously taking the rough end of the sick. Enter the brood parasitism. In brood parasitism, brood parasites also leave their eggs in another species' nest. The difference is, in most cases, the host offsprings will be removed completely, leaving only the parasites behind. The most famous example of brood parasitism is of course, the cuckoo. In case you are wondering, this bird is the origin of the word cuckoo. Cuckoos will leave their eggs in other birds' nests. To be precise, they will replace one of the host's eggs with their own egg. After it hatch, the cuckoo offspring usually pushes the other eggs away, leaving only itself behind. Cuckoo's offsprings are so big and noisy that the hosts usually couldn't help but feed them until they leave the nest. Sometimes, Hosts are unaware that they are raising other birds' offspring, which might be outrageous for you, but it is what it is. Cuckoo also exhibit coevolution with their hosts, an evolutionary arms race, where they evolve a way to deceive the hosts, while the hosts also evolve a way to identify Cuckoo's egg as to not get deceived, and this happened a couple of times reciprocally. I've already talked about this in my co-evolution video, so do check that one out if you want to learn more about this. Another case for why brood parasitism could happen is because of a thing called the mafia hypothesis. In this case, hosts accept their fate because if they don't raise the parasite's offsprings, the brood parasite will destroy their nest. The brood parasite will occasionally visit the nest to see whether the hosts are properly looking after their offspring. If not, then, like I say, they destroy their nest. You know, like a mafia, hence the name. This behavior can be observed in the brown-headed cowbird. Oh, by the way, there are other types of brood parasitism, but in the other cases, there's no alloparenting involved. Because alloparenting is the topic of this video, I'm not gonna talk about those other forms of brood parasitism. Perhaps I'll make its own video sometimes though. Now, we move on to the type that might make some of you laugh. 
cocklery. And yes, this is not me making a joke. That is indeed a scientifically used term for this case. Cockledry are prevalent in fishes. So, most fishes don't do internal fertilization. Females usually lay their unfertilized eggs in their nest. Then, males will release sperms into the water to fertilize these eggs. In many cases, other males will sneak into the nest and then release their sperm to fertilize these females' eggs. And so, the eggs will be fertilized by another male. Unknowingly, the male of the pair will take care of the spawns, of course, because he thought that's his offspring. And this is the case of cockledry, where a male unknowingly raises an offspring that are not his. In fishes, the sneaker males are usually the lesser males, because the better males would get their own females. Which is why the lesser males need to sneak their gamete to a female's eggs to even get the chance of proliferation. But that is the case of cockledry in fishes. Cockledry also exists in birds, especially colonial birds. Some colonial birds are known to be monogamous, meaning one male will form a pair with one female. However, in many cases, females will perform extra pair copulation meaning they copulate with males that are not their pair. By doing so, extra pair fertilization could happen. And yes, same with the fish case of cockledry. Female will usually lay an egg and the male will take care of it, thinking it's their own offsprings. In this case, lesser males are more prone to cockledry. So yeah, this one is quite similar to the cockledry that most of you have heard of in human. While we are talking about alloparenting, I would like to introduce you to a term called agonistic buffering. Agonistic buffering is a behavior where a male will take care of a children, whether it's their own offsprings or not, just to avoid aggression. Basically, they are using the child as a shield, because attacking him means potentially harming the child. This is a theory that might apply to primates. And yes, I would like to emphasize that this is a theory that is not exactly widely accepted. It still need a lot of evidence to be proven correct. Another thing that I would like to talk about is, animals do evolve in some ways to avoid being in the rough end of the stick. For example, animals evolve ways to identify their eggs or offsprings better to avoid brood parasites. Some also develop ways to avoid cockledry, as funny as it might sound. In some fishes, if they detect potential cockleders around their nests, and they aren't sure whether the eggs are fertilized by their sperms or not, the male would straight up eat the eggs or eat the offsprings. That might sound extreme, but hey, animals gotta do what they gotta do to proliferate while also preserving their resources and energy. And yeah, whether it's beneficial or not, if an animal is taking care of offsprings that are not their own, it is categorized as alloparenting. Who knows? Maybe we'll discover other forms of alloparenting in the future. But for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, if you want to read about the specific cases that I talk about in more detail, you could check out the references in the description. Just look for the one you are curious about. Anyway, enjoy your day.